We are continuing in our sermon series uh, in the book of Ephesians, and today we're going to talk about Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, and I'm going to be honest, we're going to really talk about 15 through 20, and I'm going to just use 21 as the teaser for what is to come next. So as a quick recap of what we've been talking about in Ephesians, in the first part of the letter, uh, Paul tells us, this is who you are in Christ. If you know Jesus you are a new creation, you, your, your old life is gone, you have to leave that behind. And then in the second half of the letter, starting in chapter 4, he calls us to imitate God in our actions, to live out the calling we have. And he says to, to do this not because uh, we just try really hard, it's really because through the work of the Holy Spirit, God is changing our minds and our hearts, and that that change that he's doing, that he's producing in us, is what bears the fruit of changes in our actions and our lives. In chapter 4, especially verses 17 through 5, 2, he calls us to set apart ourselves by what we do. Last week, we talked about how he commands us uh, in the last two weeks what to avoid. And today, we're going to talk about walking in wisdom. And we're going to talk about a couple of, of subjects today that are... That are um, to be honest, I think we struggle with as the church. Um, not just Estes Brook, but I think the church in general, we really struggle with how do we walk wisely in the world that we live in? And Paul had some words to the church at Ephesus and their surrounding communities on how to do that. So we're going to pray and dive into God's word for us today. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open your word to us and that your spirit would lead us, guide us, and direct us in your truth. Challenge us, Lord. Change our hearts and our minds. The things in our lives that don't align with you, Lord. Give us eyes to see those things. And give us a willingness to change those things, Lord. The things in our lives that draw us or others away from you, Lord, help us to, to be wise about that. And Lord, overall, we need your Spirit's help to walk in wisdom. Show us what that looks like. We ask this in Jesus' name. So starting in verse 15, Paul says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So we're going to talk about a couple of things in this. By the way, I just want to point something out. Um, the book of Ephesians is normally dated to around 62-ish A.D., A.D. 62. So it is almost 2,000 years old. Okay? So I want you to, I know, I know we have this knee-jerk reaction that we do where we read ourselves into a text. And there's nothing wrong with that per se as long as we understand this. I hear a lot of people say, man, things are getting real bad. Things are bad. 2,000 years ago, Paul looked around and said the days are evil. I have people say, oh, man, it's worse now than ever. No, it's not. No, it's not. Not than ever. We see cultural changes and shifts happening in our country, and we can lament that all we want, but... Boy, we, we've been living in kind of a bubble, and that bubble's being popped, and I think we're upset about that, and maybe we should be. But 2,000 years ago, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul looked around at the city of Ephesus, the Roman Empire, everything going on around him that was much more closed off to the gospel than the world we live in, that had a lot more against it, and he said, the days are evil. And he was also speaking prophetically to say, not just today, I mean, in general. This is a general thing. But we're going to look at what he says about that and why that it is important, but it's because it's supposed to motivate us. So, Paul urges us to use care in how we live. That's when he says, be careful how you walk. The term walk used in the New Testament in this kind of way is used... Uh, symbolically or metaphorically to mean how you live. And he says to walk wisely. 
How we live calls for wisdom. Now, what do we mean by wisdom? Wisdom is applying the truth of God to our lives. Okay? It's applying the truth that we, we get from God and applying it to our lives. Okay? I've used this joke before, but they say intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Charisma is selling a fruit, uh, uh, or sorry, I, I misspoke. Uh, wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit smoothie. Charisma is selling a fruit uh, ketchup and calling it a fruit smoothie. So wisdom is like not only knowing stuff, but then applying that information. A lot of us have spent a lot of our life, if, if we've been a Christian for a long time, um, I know I, I've been a Christian for about 30 years, which is strange. I still kind of think that I'm a new Christian. Um, and I've been a Christian for longer than I've not been a Christian, almost twofold. Um, and I still think, like, man, I'm really young in my faith. And we spend a lot of our time learning stuff out of this book, which is great. But this isn't wisdom. Applying it is wisdom. We gain a lot of facts and information. Right? Like, uh, if you grew up in the church and I said, who was the oldest man to ever live? Anyone know? Methuselah, gold star, you get into heaven. No, you don't, and it has nothing to do with anything. It's just a piece of information, right? And by the way, that information doesn't actually do us a whole lot of good in our daily life, does it? It's great information. Methuselah, by the way, probably died the year of the flood. Also interesting information, but doesn't help us. We can gain a lot of information, but if we don't do anything with it, it's not wisdom. Wisdom is applying the truth of God to our lives. And Scripture calls us to be wise over and over again. And when you look at the book of Proverbs, especially, um, books like Ecclesiastes, even some of the Psalms, uh, you know, in the New Testament, specifically the book of James, but a lot, a lot of Scripture in general, they're called wisdom literature. They're things that we read because they give us insight into life. But it takes God-given, Spirit-led thinking to apply those truths to our lives. Now, I know we want a book of instructions, right? You guys have all, maybe you haven't all, but some of you have heard the acronym for the Bible. Bible, basic instruction before leaving earth. Bible, great. Here's the thing. There are instructions in Scripture. But some of those instructions need wisdom in how we apply them. We want a 10 easy steps to live out your Christian life in the Bible doesn't give us those things. We want the, uh, we want, give me a handbook on how to re raise my teenager. Uh, we don't have that book in the Bible. And you might say, why? Why wouldn't God give us that? Because how the truth of God is applied in situations is situational. And I know that might fly in the face of a lot of things that we think, but it's actually biblical. And what I mean by that is truth is truth. That doesn't change. But the application of that truth will alter depending on the situation we're in. And wisdom is knowing how and when to apply certain truths. One example I often give is in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he perish in his sin. The very next verse. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be thought a fool yourself. Wait a second. One says do it, and one says don't. So is the Bible contradicting itself? No, it's situational. The situation determines when we apply that which truth. If we see someone struggling in sin that is leading them to death and we're like, we need to call them to repent, and they have ears to hear it, we should do so. But if, man, I'm just going to correct somebody on something and they don't have the ears to hear it, or maybe it's not an issue of, of salvation or, or eternity, it's just like, you're wrong about this, and it's just going to wind up leading to an argument, I look like a fool answering this fool according to his folly. In which case, 
the author of Proverbs there says, don't waste your breath. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 7. He says, do not judge others, lest you be judged yourselves in the same manner that you judge others, you also will be judged. But then at the end of all of that, he says, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls before swine. And we take the first part and say, we're not supposed to judge people. I got it. Actually, no. Jesus says, unless, and he goes on to talk about a plank in your own eye. He says, listen, don't pass condemnation on people, but if you see somebody in sin, make sure that you don't have a plank in your own eye so that you can actually address them in that sin. But then he goes on to say, use wisdom in this. Don't go through this effort and give them these kernels of truth and wisdom if they're going to treat them like a dog would or a pig would. It requires wisdom. How we apply biblical truth is somewhat sub- subjective by the situation, or at least situation, situational. And what I mean by situational is it will depend on the situation. It depends on the culture we're in. So this week I had something happen to me. Um, we bought our house about four and a half, almost five years ago. And it was a brand new house when we bought it. And the, uh, the guy who built our house is a new, like this was the first house he ever built from scratch. And he said at our closing, I don't think I'm ever doing this again, which is a sign of confidence, right? And in the process, they like we, our, our lot used to be woods on the, in, 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 we live in Elk River, on the corner. And I think a lot of our neighbors were upset that the woods got tore down for our house to be built. Now we didn't, we didn't know any of this. We didn't like say, build us a house. He built a house, he put it on the market, we bought it. We didn't have any input in what happened when it was purchased. And in this, one of the things he did in this, there's some weird things in our house that's fine, we like our house, but there's some weird things. There wasn't a door in a bed, one of the bedrooms, and we're like, this is obviously supposed to be a bedroom, so we put a door in. But one of the things that he did was, two things that he did that were really weird is he, he put a fence in, but only on a little small section of the, of the, the yard, and he put it too close to the, to the, uh, the sidewalk. It was so close that at closing, the city said, you can't close until this is fixed. It's outside of city ordinances. So they came back and they fixed it by moving it exactly to the line that they had to. And twice in the last five years, uh, the city snowblower will come by and they will snowblow and it will knock a section of our fence over. This year it was really bad. It broke a section. And I'm trying to figure out how do I fix this because... It's like a thing, and it's like they, these parts aren't available anymore. Do I have to replace the whole fence? And that's a lot of money. It's a thing, right? So it's taking some time. I'm also very busy, so I was like, okay, I'm not going to. And on top of that, first time building a home, he, uh, they, they got, um, they didn't sod our lawn. And we had no say in this. This all happened before. Uh, very sandy soil. They got like this, this kind of cheap sod slash uh, grass seed mix that they put down. And it took, and in some parts of our lawn it's super lush, and i got to mow it like once a week. But parts of our lawn, the south-facing part, is dry, and as you all know, it's super dry this year. And we have like an irrigation system, so I keep it watered and everything, but it's still not, it's not doing great. And most of our neighbors' houses have been there for, for a long time, and ours is relatively new. And I'm I'm not the kind of guy who cares about that stuff. I don't care. Like, our yard doesn't look phenomenal. I don't care. I keep it mowed, you know. I do what I can, but I'm like, I'm not spending thousands of dollars on having a well-manicured lawn because I think it's actually, for some people, I think it's a pride issue. It's like, look at my lawn. Look at how great I am. And I'm like, I don't care. I have other time, things I want to spend my time and my energy on. I do maintenance. And, and at the same time, I'm trying to, like, deal with some, like, you know, stuff that's popped up. And uh, our neighbor next door, his house was built like a year before ours, so he took up some of the woods too. He's retired. I, I think he doesn't have anything else to do. So he mows his lawn at least twice a week. He waters his lawn twice a day. Uh, and we're in, a, we're in a ban right now. You're only supposed to water every other day, and he's watering twice a day. His lawn is lush. Like, it's real nice. He, and he has people come out and treat his lawn like five times a year. And he does, like, it's a thing. It's like, it's, but it's what he wants to do. It's fine. I don't care. And the other day, 
I'm walking outside, and we were talking about how are we dealing with these weeds and stuff we have in our yard, these prickler plant plants, and I've put some stuff out, and it's just not doing it. And he's got a guy out here servicing his lawn. So I go and talk to the guy. I say, hey, look at our lawn. What do I do about this? And he said, yeah, yeah, you, you, well, you kill it. You just kill it off and start over, is basically what he said. He's like, this is, and he told me, he walked me through, he's like, I'm pretty sure I know what happened here. And I said, this is exactly what happened. And so we go through this whole process, right? And you say, wisdom, what does this have to do with wisdom? I get done with that process, I have to, I was, I was leaving the house, uh, and I come back and I get our mail, and there's a letter in our mailbox, like a handwritten letter, how nice, addressed to neighbor in our address, sent through the actual mail, not like someone dropped it in our mailbox, somebody mailed it, it's got a stamp on it, and it's a letter saying, your lawn is garbage, gossip around the neighborhood, just do something with it, why are you watering weeds? And I'm like, wow. And my pride just, oh, it, it popped up. And my, my first two immediate thoughts were like, I'm, I'm doubling down. I'm going to get it as weedy as I can get it. I don't even care. Like, I'm going like, to be like, I want to be that house now. I want to be the house that everyone's like, what is wrong with you guys? This is so that you guys all, because you guys all talk about it. This is what you're doing. And I was like, this is wrong. That is coming from a bad place in me. And then I thought, man, I am well aware of the situation with our lawn and our own priorities in life. And balancing all of that out is tricky. There is nothing in Scripture that says, keep a well-maintained lawn, and here's the five easy steps to do it. You know why? First of all, because it is pride and God doesn't address lawn maintenance. Second of all, it was written in an arid climate where most people didn't have lawns. In fact, I don't know if you know this, lawns are new. The reason we have in cityscapes, we have manicured lawns is a, actually a holdout from the Victorian and Elizabethan era when the only people that could have a manicured lawn were wealthy. Everyone else just had what you had. I grew up in the country. We had a part of a field and we mowed some of it and that was our lawn. Like whatever grew, grew. We didn't care. Right? Some of you live in the country, you're like, yep, or you just get your sheep on there and they take care of it and that's what you get. Right? Right. That is the way people have lived most of their lives. But as a status symbol, lawns became a thing. And so I have to balance all of that information with, now oh, my neighbors are bothered by this. What do I do? And the funny thing is, if that person, and I'm going to say it wasn't a coward about it, because that's a cowardly thing to do, right? If you have an issue with somebody, what should you do? They don't even know my name. They put neighbor, right? They could have just come and talked to me and said, hey, what's going on with your lawn? And I would have said, here's what's going on with our lawn. And they would probably would have said, oh, man, that sucks. Well, if there's anything I can do to help, let me know. And then when they talk to the rest of the neighbors that are apparently concerned about it, they could share that information. But when that's not done, what happens? They even said it, gossip. Is he lazy? He's not lazy. You see him out there mowing his lawn every week, even when it doesn't need it sometimes, and spreading stuff on his lawn to kill it. And the funny thing is if they would have come and talked to me Literally 20 minutes before that, I was talking to a guy about treating our lawn. I also have other issues, you know, like that I would talk to them about, about like, I don't want to spray a bunch of chemicals on my lawn to kill stuff and kill all the bees in the process. We've talk, I'm considering planting clover in my yard because I think pollinators could use it and it's low maintenance and it's better for the environment. It's lower on water costs and all these other things. But that looks different than other people's lawns. But that's also not really a neighborhood thing. I don't have an HOA. If I did, we wouldn't have moved there because I'm not for that. But this is a wisdom thing, right? I'm not asking them to act in wisdom. They probably should have. But I have to decide and seek the Lord in this and say, how do I respond? So my knee-jerk reaction was, I'm going to let it just go bad, real bad. And then I'm like, I can't do that. I mean, I want my kids to play in the yard. And then my second reaction is, I should make like a note. You know, like you see those Karen posts? where like somebody puts a note, hey, Karen, 
Sorry if your name is Karen, uh, that, but you know what the term Karen means in our culture, right? A Karen, someone who complains about something and they have no idea what they're talking about. They just like to complain kind of thing. I was going to, you know, I thought I should put a note, in, like a sign in our yard. Hey, Karens who don't like our yard, let me explain why it's in the state it's in. And I thought, why? Why am I doing that? That is just as much me being concerned about their opinion as, and, and it's, there's some pride in it on my part too. It calls for wisdom. That is not an e- there's not an easy fix to that, right? And this is a stupid thing. This is a lawn. Who cares, right? In the grand scheme of things, who cares? Every day, we come up against situations in our life that we have to say, how do I handle this? And then we look to God's word, and we might see some principles there, but then we have to ask, which principles do I apply, and how do I apply them? It's not as straightforward as we want to make it out to be. And sometimes we minimize issues, and we say, the biblical answer is this. I do that sometimes. But sometimes there isn't a straightforward scriptural answer because God doesn't address those issues directly. Instead, he often addresses the principles at play within an issue, and then we have to figure out how to apply those principles. But here's the good news. We are not left alone to do that. Wisdom in Scripture is applying the truth of God to live our lives. It's not universal in its application. I just gave you a ton of examples of that. It's situational. I'll give you a second to fill those in if you're filling them in. But I want us to notice something. In this context, Paul says, redeem your time. Now, what does that mean? It means claiming our time for God's kingdom. He he calls on us to redeem our time, to use our time in a way that is kingdom building. In our lives, in any given day, in any given moment, in any situation, we have a variety of things that vie for our time and our attention. We are called to make wise choices in how we use our time. What things are we investing our time and energy, our money and other resources in? And are they kingdom building? It's tough. It's tough. When we have a lot of things vying for our attention, we have to have the wisdom to say no to the right things and yes to the the right things. We have to say no to the things that are not going to build the kingdom and build us in it and say yes to the things that will. And sometimes the yes ones are not the ones we want to say yes to. Sometimes they're the ones we want to say no to and we want to say yes to the other things. Redeeming our time is saying, I am going to purchase my time back from the things that would distract and use them for the kingdom. This calls for wisdom. This is not me saying, by the way, I'm not saying this. I don't think scripture is saying this. That means that don't do anything that's fun because that's not kingdom building. No, some things are relationship building that, which can, can be when intentional kingdom building. There are things that I do with my kids that you'd be like, what a waste of time. For them, it's not. For them, it is a way to bond with me and to connect. It's an opportunity for God to, to speak truth into their lives and into mine. We all have those things in our lives. I mentioned golf last week. If you like to play golf, you're not sinning by playing golf. But maybe ask God, is there a way that I can redeem this time? What do I do with it? Maybe you invite somebody with you to go golfing that's not a Christian. Or maybe someone that is a Christian that you say, this is a time for fellowship and building one another up. Yeah, and we happen to spend a lot of time and money chasing a ball around. Okay. It's okay. I'm not going to ask if anybody in here plays golf because I don't want to 
We don't have to have a throwdown or something. <laughs> and, and this is what Paul says. We do this even as we live in a world in opposition to God. He says the days are evil. In fact, he says we do this because the days are evil. Because we live in a world that is in opposition to God, we have to have wisdom and carve out time for the kingdom. Because otherwise, our time will be eaten up by other things. Because that is the way of the world. That is not the way of this specific moment in human history. That is all of human history. When Paul says the days are evil, he could have said something else, but he doesn't. I'm not trying to make an argument from silence, but he could have said, because these days are evil. He could have made that distinction, and you'd say, what does that mean? If he would have said, because these days are evil, the implication would be because the time he was living in was corrupt. But he would be setting it against other time that wasn't, correct? But he doesn't say that. He says, because the days, or even it could be translated, because days are evil. Time is an evil thing. We live with a limited commodity, and we live in an age, and that age is still going on, that is in opposition to God. So when the kingdom of God comes fully with Christ's return, we don't have to redeem the time. Everything we'll do will be for the kingdom. But right now, we have to actually use wisdom in how we use our time. And he says that one way to do this is avoiding foolishness. The Bible defines foolishness as to live or claim, uh, claim or live as if there is no God. There's multiple verses that say this, uh, Psalm 14, 1, and uh, again, almost almost word for word, Psalm 53, 1 says the same thing. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. By the way, notice he doesn't say they don't do good. He says no one does good. But the fool doesn't acknowledge that. The fool says in their heart there is no God. Foolish behavior is behavior that is us pretending that God doesn't exist or acting like he doesn't. Either we're ignorant of God's existence, maybe we're atheist or agnostic or we're of some other faith, Or, we know there's a God, but we kind of like to, what we call, have uh, cognitive dissonance. We say we believe there's a God, but we act like he doesn't exist. I'm going to do this thing because no one else is around. No one else will know. Do you believe in God? Absolutely. Is he everywhere? Yes, so you're not alone. Oh, uh, that's right. We're not. Foolish behavior is behavior that doesn't acknowledge God, that lives as if God isn't real. And we're called to avoid that. Wisdom means seeking God's will. And I said this earlier. The good news to this is we're not alone in it. This is done through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We don't have to just read the Bible and say, okay, and now I've got to figure out how to apply this in which situation. I just guess I'm on my own. Oof, uh, boy, and I figured it out different than you figured it out, so let's argue about it. Let's have different denominations about it. Let's, uh, let's not talk to those people because even though they say they follow Jesus, they want to apply those truths differently. Well, that's what happens sometimes when we're not led by the Spirit, but that also sometimes happens when we are led by the Spirit because we might be in different situations and God might call through the Spirit, lead me to to apply truth in a a way that is different than the way he might ask you to apply it. We can have that conversation, though. And actually, Paul kind of gets into an aspect of that in the next verse. He says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, he's adding something new here, but it goes along with what he said. As an example of foolish living, he says, don't be drunk on wine. Now, I'm going to take a huge leap here. The text says wine. I'm pretty sure he just meant alcohol of any type. In fact, I would take a step further than that. I think, based on the context, he is talking about 
drunkenness in general as being something that is foolish. So the excessive, excessive alcohol or other substances which lower one's inhibitions. Now, if you don't know this, this is the issue with alcohol and other substances like that. They lower your inhibitions. If you are someone who struggles with anger and you get drunk, you might bottle that anger when you're sober, but when you are drunk, that anger will come out because it is not being held back. If you struggle with lust, that will come out. Whatever you struggle with that you are trying to keep under control, when you introduce something into the mix that takes away that control, those things come out. That's the issue. Now, you'll also notice he says drunkenness. And I know this is somewhat controversial, but he doesn't say drinking. He just says drunkenness, which is excessive. Jesus drank wine. He made the best, turned water into wine, the best wine at the party. Some people struggle with it. Some people can't touch the stuff. They shouldn't. Some people have a history with family stuff. They shouldn't touch it. If you're around other people that, uh, that struggle with it, you shouldn't touch it with them. Just, you might say it's foolish to even drink it at all. We can have that conversation. I struggle with that for a very long time. Everybody's going to land differently on this. And here's the thing about foolishness. Again, not an argument from silence, but Paul is very careful in his word choice, and the Holy Spirit was careful in leading him. He uses the term foolishness in connection with these things. He doesn't use the word sin. And I think there's a distinction that we are not careful to make. We can do foolish things and not be sinning, right? My kids can say silly words that don't mean anything. They can, you know, be flailing around and knock something over because they weren't being careful, and, and somebody gets hurt or something gets broken in the process. Are they sinning? Are they being like, I'm intentionally trying to, or I'm just, you know, yeah, no, they're being thoughtless. And you might want to argue that that's a sin, but I don't think that's actually the issue. I don't think it's an issue of, uh, let's categorize this as a sin or a not sin. It, it's foolish. It's it just not thinking about God or others. So maybe we should think about God or in other people. So we are called to do that. So if you're somebody who says drinking alcohol is a sin, Scripture will not support that. You could say, I think drinking alcohol is foolish. And Scripture probably would support some level of that. But since Scripture doesn't use that terminology, I think we need to be careful about that. And again... This is a wisdom thing. It takes wisdom. We don't want wisdom. You know what, by the way, you, so there's two, the, the, kind of the two general responses to things that require wisdom within Christian circles are either we say, I, that's too hard to figure out, I'm just going to ignore it. Right? So you're just like, I can just do whatever I want. It's not a big deal. Or we say, Wisdom is too hard to apply. We're just going to make a rule about it. We'll just make a rule and say, this is the rule. Don't do it. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't hang out with people that do. Scripture doesn't say that, but we're going to set up a rule that says that because it's easier than trying to have wisdom in a situation and rely on the Holy Spirit. It is, by the way, the very thing. I'm writing a 25-page paper right now on Paul and Second Temple Judaism. It is the very thing that the Pharisees did daily to make sure that people weren't sinning. They said, listen, we want, God says to rest on the Sabbath. Here, we're going to put a rule, this many steps. Now you don't have to think about it. Except you have to think about how many steps you're taking. They made a rule. And then Jesus comes along and says, you're not even listening to the Spirit in this. And you're, by the way, in this, you're under cutting the truth of the word. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier. We want five easy steps. We want ten simple rules. But that is not life. This is about, so Paul says, don't, don't do this. 
don't do this. Don't, don't get drunk. That will drop your inhibitions and lead you to foolish behavior. It's, it's, it's foolish. Don't do it. What does he say instead? He says, be filled with the Spirit. What does the Spirit do in us? Instead of lowering our inhibitions, the Spirit gives us self-control. The very opposite. The fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruit of, aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's the opposite of a lack of inhibition. It is our inhibition. The Holy Spirit, when he fills us, will tell us, don't do that. Why? It's not going to end well. Don't do that. Why? I want you to think about that person next to you and how that's going to affect them. Hey, I know this is outside of your comfort zone, but I want you to go and talk to that person. Yeah, but that person does X, Y, and Z. They need you right now. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives us self-control and guidance and wisdom where we wouldn't otherwise have it. Drunkenness robs us of that self-control. That's why. And by the way, it is no accident that um, wine and other alcohol, even in the ancient world, had the, the, like the term spirits was associated with it. Don't be filled with spirits, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's kind of a, there's a bit of a play on idea here, if not words. And then Paul says this, be filled with the Spirit, and then he says all one sentence. When you're filled with the Spirit, this is what the kinds of things you'll do. You'll address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. All one thought that goes along with what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. What does this mean? He starts out by saying, instead, when the Spirit fills you, what will happen? You'll be the kind of person that encourages others. How? He says you'll encourage them using Scripture, Psalms, and God-centered, he lists two different types of God-centered music. He says Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And you might say, oh, do they have hymns and spiritual songs back then? Yes, they did. Hymns were songs that were written in a certain form that were used in settings. It's much like the song that we sang this morning, His Mercy is More. That would be considered a hymn. And sometimes it was like doctrine set to music. Spiritual songs were much more like what we would call like a praise chorus. Those existed even in the first century. Both. They didn't have worship wars over them. They just encouraged each other with them. He said that we are to use those things to encourage one another, and then we're supposed to worship God. The Spirit will lead us to worship God through thanksgiving or, and, and to thanksgiving. So we're going to sing melody in our heart to God, and we're to um, give thanks to God. These are the very opposite of foolishness. And then the last thing that he says is submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. This is living out being filled with the Spirit. Now, we got about uh, ten, f- five, ten minutes left in the service, so we're going to dive into what's submitting to... No, we're not going to talk about this today. You know why? Because this is a complex issue. It's so complex, in fact, that Paul spends the rest of chapter 5 and the first half of chapter 6 talking about it. And that's what we're going to do. The short answer to this is putting others before ourselves. The long answer to that is going to come over the course of the, uh, the next three sermons that I'm preaching. In the next three sermons in Ephesians, we're going to look at the three venues in which this mutual submission takes place, marriages, families, and work. And I would argue there's others, but these are the three that he specifically gives. And we're going to spend a week talking about each of those. In fact, the week that we land on families, we are intentionally not having children's church. We're going to have the kids upstairs because this is a message for them and for the adults. Now, those sermons are going to start on the 23rd, which is in three weeks. You might say, what? What are we doing in between? 
Well, actually, what we're doing next week is we have Bruce Johnson coming. So many of you know Bruce. Some of you guys know Bruce. Um, Bruce uh, is con strongly connected with our congregation. Uh, he's, uh, him and his wife live in the Malacca area. Uh, Bruce has been serving in Bolivia uh, for years, and he travels back and forth to Bolivia all the time. You'll get, if you're part of the church email chain, you'll get emails about Bruce all the time. Bruce is traveling, blah, blah, blah. He's going to come and share what God's doing in Bolivia and, and, and just share with us in general next Sunday. And then the following Sunday, we have our, uh, our time of uh, sh uh, uh, prayer and sharing. So we have kind of a two-week break. That, was, that is now planned because I wanted us to be able to spend time looking at these things together. And it worked out very well because now that fifth Sunday that we normally would be like, what are we going to do for children's church? The kids are going to be upstairs, and it works out very well. So God's, God's uh, direction and wisdom in that as well. So that is where we're going. But this week, we, kind of our so what for this week, are, are, are we walking wisely, living in those filled with the Spirit? Are we letting the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us into applying God's truth to our lives? Are we living out, or are we living out a poor imitation? That's what drunkenness is. It's a poor imitation, right? Being led by something else. We don't want to do that. We want to be filled with the Spirit and let the Spirit lead us to walk wisely, to live wisely. And in the weeks to come, when we look at this idea of submission and love, we're going to be looking at how does that look in those settings because Paul addresses all of that. So here's our meditation verse for this week. Um, as I read this, I'm going to ask Jim to come up and he's going to lead us in a time of prayer. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. 